17. A few verses. That says, six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter blurted out, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want I'll make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Verse 14. At the bottom of the mountain, they were met by a crowd of waiting people. As they approached, a man came out of the crowd and fell to his knees begging, Master, have mercy on my son. He goes out of his mind and suffers terribly, falling into seizures. Frequently he is pitched into the fire and other times into the river. I brought him to your disciples, but they could do nothing for him. Jesus said, what a generation. No sense of God. No focus to your lives. How many times do I have to go over these things? How much longer do I have to put up with this? Bring the boy here. He ordered the afflicting demon out, and it was out, gone. From that moment on, the boy was well. Father, blessings upon thy word and de nombre for Jesus. Amen. I want to share the wording of the Message Bible from verse 14, and that's my subject today, at the bottom of the mountain. Would you say that with me? At the bottom. Say it again. At the bottom of the mountain. We are people who do not celebrate people who are at the bottom. If you're at the bottom of anything, good luck. Nobody has any holler for people who are at the bottom. We celebrate, we make Hebrew heroes out of people who have gotten to the top. And in many cases, we direct our attention to those individuals and many of our youth aspire to be like them, and some seniors aspire or wish, or maybe, maybe we can get there. Thank God for 7 Eleven. He might help me to get to the top. And so we have astronomical people playing the lottery for millions and billions. Why? Because they want to get to the top. Like an Oprah, Oprah Winfrey, who's worth $2.7 billion. Or a Beyonce and Jay-Z, who's worth $760 million. Or Sean Diddy Combs, worth $550 million. Or Floyd May, Mayweather, $400 million. Or Steve Harvey, $100 million. Or LeBron James, worth, worth $65 million. Or a Joel Osteen. 40 million. People all over the spectrum, different occupations, who have made it to the top. And then there are those who are headed in that direction, like a Steph Curry, 
or Draymond Green or Cam Newton or The Weeknd. You older folks don't know anything, but you thought, you thought I'm talking about Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That's not what I'm talking about. These individuals who are making it to the top that we see on BET, that we see on CNN, that we see on Fox, that we see on NBC, we see ABC, we see them on Good Morning America, we see them on Today, we see them and uh, it, it creates something in us that we want to be like them or we want to know them or we want to at least have an opportunity to experience them and so we spend hundreds of dollars for an event just to see these individuals. We, we pay hundred dollars to see people who are dead. Michael Jackson, Elvis Presley, you see. Because we are envious of those who have made it to the top. Our text says, six days later, Jesus took Peter and two brothers, James and John, and led them up a high mountain to be alone. Jesus took three individuals to the top. As compared to our text, at the bottom of the mountain, they were met by a crowd of waiting people. So three men made it to the top, and there's a whole crowd at the bottom. But says there are more people at the bottom than will ever make it to the top. But where, where is the discouragement? The discouragement lies at the bottom. It is so easy to become discouraged because those who are at the top want to stay there with little concern with that with what goes on with those who are at the bottom. Same in the church. If we are not careful, it's the same in the church. We've got the chief apostle, Peter, who's blurting out and saying, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. It is great. I, I can imagine he's looking at the view and he's looking at things that people at the bottom could never imagine. And Peter says, Lord, it's, it's wonderful that we are here where? At the top. So since Favor is upon us to get to the top. How about let's stay here? You have to be careful that when God allows you to get to the top, that you don't have the attitude, I want to stay here. Because your experience at the top is only so you can bless those who are at the bottom. At the bottom of the mountain, this is where the crowd is. This is where the population is. This is where all the people are. This is where the hurt is. This is where the needs are. This is where the... The, the trauma is going on. This is where the dysfunctionality is going on. This is where our youth are going crazy. Our youth are hurting. Our youth are suffering at, at the bottom of the mountain. No, no, no youth up there. There were no needs up there. There were, there were no ill effects up there. there <laughs> it was bliss up there. Peter said, I want to stay here. Every once in a while, God will sweep in a service and just take us out of ourselves. Glorious service. 
And you say, ah! Well, I, want, oh, I wish I could just, I wish I didn't have to go to work tomorrow. We want to stay at the top, not realizing that the struggles of our black youth are at the bottom of the mountain. One of four blacks under the age of 25 without work, close to half of the million young people without work in our country are African Americans. One third less blacks have college degrees as whites. Students who have been suspended are up to five times more likely not to finish high school. Our African American young people are locked into three employers. The largest employers for our youth are three. Number one, the military. Number two, McDonald's. Number three, drugs. Those are the choices that are given to many of our young people at the bottom. At the bottom is where they're out of control. Drugs, alcohol, tobacco, sex. One out of every two eighth grade girls has had at least one sexual experience. One of every four eighth grade girls will become pregnant. One of every seven eighth grade girls will have an abortion, venereal disease, HIV positive. We're talking about a generation that is overcome, overwhelmed, overburdened, and overweight. I would talk about being overweight, but I got to conquer that one first. Amen. There are challenges. We're in a community here. We are in a community. We have been. We purposely came to this side of town. This church would be much, much larger if it were on the east side. But we purposely chose this location for the message of reconciliation because our hearts were not only out for the blacks but also Hispanics and the whites or anyone else, any other nationality that's in this community. Amen. <laughs> Let me tell you something about this community, the Hispanics. We thank God that our plan worked. Thank God for the Rodriguez family. Thank God for the Espinades Espindes family. Thank God for all of, of these, the Casitas. Thank God for all of these. Our plan worked. Amen. <laughs> Hispanics are the nation's largest minority group and among its fastest growing populations. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, the Hispanic population in 2012 was 53 million, <coughs> making up 17% of the U.S. population. They have outgrown the blacks, African Americans community in this nation. According to a Pew Research poll, Latino people are the second most discriminated against ethnic group after African Americans. In 2011, less than 30% of Hispanic students graduated from high school and less than 4% earned advanced college degrees. More than 20% of Hispanic females under the age of 18 live below the poverty level. Hispanic females earn roughly 54 cents for every dollar earned by a white or a non-Hispanic male, which accounts for a loss of almost $24,000 in a year's time. In 2011, Hispanics had the highest dropout rate, 17%, for students ages 16 through 24. More than 6 million Latino children were in poverty in 2010. Two-thirds of them were from immigrant uh, uh, parents. Roughly 30% of Hispanics are in the U.S. 
uh, lack of health coverage or they lack health coverage. And, and, and the st stats go on and on and on and on. I I'm telling you that we are here dealing with the Hispanic community, dealing with African American community. We are here and this is what we are challenged with at the bottom of the mountain. Amen? At the bottom of the mountain. We cannot afford to keep shouting and dancing and praising with our tamarines at the top and not understand what we are dealing with. At, I can't get no help up in here. And at the bottom of the mountain, at the bottom of the mountain, there's, there's a father who doesn't know what to do with a child who is traumatized. Sometimes he throws himself in the fire. He has moments of insanity. We're talking about a generation that this young man represents. An insane generation. A generation on crack. A generation on drugs. A generation they don't know where they are. They don't know where they're waking up. They don't know where they're riding. They don't know if they're riding on the right side of the street or the wrong. <laughs> We're talking about a generation and, and who came and the father brought the son to the church and the church was worthless. Sometimes the church is more concerned with getting than giving. Sometimes the church is more concerned with politics than deliverance. Sometimes, sometimes we're more concerned with title than ministry. Let me, let me say this on this day. Don't let your title be more important to you than your calling. Amen. The priorities of Christ must become ours. If his priorities do not become ours, stop dancing, stop praising, stop running, because you are representing another God. But the Christ of this text will take the time to give this generation a solution. This generation needs a solution. Our seniors need a solution. Our young people need a solution. Seniors need to know that their income is not fixed. That God never fixed it. Let me say in passing, because I want to quit. Oh, my Lord. Who's been messing with my watch here? <laughs> this father came down because he didn't know what to do with his son. There are many fathers who don't know what to do with the son. Many parents who don't know what to do with their children. Parents who need help with their children. Because you're limited in your ability to assist them. This, this father was present in the house. He was present in the family. Must not have been black. He was present in the house. But he was helpless. You young men, when you have babies, stay with them. Stop creating more for my tax to eat up. Right. Taking care of your child. That's why we call you deadbeat. Right. But we must, the church, must have ways to help yeah. 
fathers who are in a dilemma as to what to do with all the babies they have created. This father was present, but he was helpless. Father, just because you are does not mean that you will have all the answers to your child's dilemma. The deliverance of this child is the issue and not the size of your ego. When you need help, get help. When you don't know what to do with your child, ask someone. When you don't know how to be a father in your home, find out. When you don't know how to be a husband to your wife, find out. Ask somebody. Ask somebody. We must develop programs in the church for men. Our, our, our men are too proud to admit they don't know. Ultimately, we've got to give our children hope. Those who don't have fathers around. That Jesus said, I'll be a father. Help me somebody. To the fatherless. Spiritual fathers can be more significant in your life than birthing fathers. Paul was more effective in the life of Timothy than his natural father was. Elisha had to leave his father in order to find his spiritual destiny through Elijah, his spiritual parent. When Elijah was passing off the scene, Elisha cried, my father, my father, but he wasn't his father. But he cried, my father, my father. Oh, I'm telling you that when your natural father has deserted you, that when you come to the house of God, God will make certain that you are fathered by the Holy Ghost. Ah, uh, I close. I close. Jesus came off the mountain. Came off the mountain and, and said, Peter, you're not going to stay up here. James, get your little sack and come on. John, you want to lean on my breast? It's going to be at the bottom of the mountain. Jesus, when the church did not have a cure, showed us his heart to people who are hurting because Jesus offered a cure where this young man was. He didn't rebuke the child. He rebuked the demon. We're rebuking this wrong thing. We're rebuking people when they can't help themselves. They're dealing with the spirit that is controlling them. And you can't throw them out, cast the devil out. Jesus took this boy and told that spirit that had him, had him wallowing, going into the fire, being traumatized, out of control, all the things that were going into this life. Jesus spoke to that spirit. This is why we're anointing you today. This is why we're ordaining you today. This is why you're being elevated today so you can have some more authority over spirits. Spirits that are controlling our generation. Not only spirits that are controlling our generation, spirits that are controlling some folk in the church. Y'all don't, don't hear me today. Hallelujah. We've got to understand that Jesus is a cure for everything that's going on at the bottom of the mountain. At the bottom of the mountain. At the bottom 
of the mountain. And the Bible says, the last verse that we read, from that moment on, Lord have mercy. From that moment on, the boy was well. If the church becomes saturated with the power of Jesus, we are going to have the cure to some of these things that are going on at the bottom of the mountain. We're not here without purpose. We're not in this community without purpose. Doesn't matter whether you can speak Spanish or not. When you come across a spirit, it'll recognize the Jesus in you. You've heard me tell you before, I was in, uh, where was I? I was in Suriname, Dutch Guyana, preaching, church on the balcony. And heavy set young man came at me. He spoke no no uh, English, and I spoke no Dutch. And so when he came at me, spirit of the devil came at me to tear me apart, and he could have. But thank God for the name Jesus. When he took a lunge at me to tear me asunder, I said, in the name of Jesus. I was hoping he understood. <laughs> but when I said, in the name of Jesus, he fell immediately to the floor and started writhing like a snake. <laughs> Spirit began to take him over and could feel and smell the odor coming from him that he was being delivered from. And in a few moments, he stood up and spoke in his language. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm talking about we must become a church that is anointed with the power of Jesus that demons in any language, demons in any tongue, will recognize the name of Jesus. For at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall come on, stand on your feet, and give him praise. I close with this. I close with this. That not only can Jesus cure what's at the bottom, but he can take what's at the bottom. A Peter who curses. He can take a life who has known the bottom and lived at the bottom and wallowed in the bottom, and he knows how to take you to the top. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Glory to God. That's what he's doing in your life. He came in your life. You may have been at the bottom, but eventually he's going to take you to the top. He won't leave you at the bottom. He'll bless you at the bottom so he can take you at the top. Hallelujah. To get a revelation of himself, to cause you to see things that you've never seen before, do things that you've never done before, see Jesus in a way that you've never seen him before. Hallelujah. Yes, leave the top and go to the bottom. If you're at the bottom, he'll take you to the top. But wherever you are in the process, give him praise because he's the answer.
God is bringing you into a high spiritual realm, elevating this church, lifting you up. It was like stilts have been placed on you today, and you've been elevated to a higher purpose. You watch what God says in, in convention. You watch what God says. You watch, you will hear things that you have not heard before. Your eyes will come open to things that you have never seen before. Because God is taking you from the bottom to the top and back to the bottom. You know why? Because you're an angel. Come on, tell somebody next to you, you're an angel. And Jacob, when he had his pillar upon his head upon the pillar, he had a dream. And he saw angels ascending. They were at the bottom. And descending. Because when they got to the top, they couldn't stay there. They had to find out what God said. They had to find out their assignment. So they were going back to the bottom. You are angels today. That God is taking you from the bottom to the top, back to the bottom, back to the top, back to the bottom, back to the top, because you're on assignment. Tell somebody you're on assignment. <laughs> Woo, thank God. You're on assignment. And the Bible said that the angels were climbing, as it were, a ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. What was that ladder? That ladder was an extension, a bridge between heaven and earth. Ladder. Ladder. Rungs of it. Steps. Heights of it. What was that ladder? I, I want to suggest to you. That that ladder was Jesus, who is the mediator between heaven and earth. He's Lord of heaven and earth. And the angels were moving up in him and down in him, getting their assignment, getting their anointing, never leaving him. You see, you never leave him. When you go up, it's him. When you come down, it's him. When you praise him, it's him. When you help somebody, it's him. It's no, oh, it's nobody but Jesus. He's the ladder that gives you the ability to ascend and descend. Ascend and descend. And Jacob laid his head on the stone that was anointed. I lay in Zion. A cornerstone. That was Jesus. The anointing was Jesus. The ladder was Jesus. Hallelujah. And the angels were climbing up on him and descending on him. Whatever goes on in your spiritual career, you're going to know. Is all Jesus. 